The ability to add tags to computer files was the first way to break free of the hierarchical structure imposed by computer folder and file systems. Fast forward to today, and computer software like Roam and Obsidian for taking notes allows us to integrate both a hierarchical structure, distributed tags across different notes, as well as an interconnectedness between different ideas. So what does that mean we do with tags in this new structure? Well, if you're anything like me, your tagging system is a mess. But I've recently discovered a new way to think about how tags operate within the system. Come with me and let me show you what I discovered. Tags are a way to add some information to your note that you might want to search or recall later. This is different than linking your note to another note or another idea within your knowledge graph. So as you can see here, I have a tag within this note. If you're just joining us, we are in the middle of exploring David Perel's essays as a seed for our growing knowledge graph. David Perel is a well-known online writer and runs a course called Rite of Passage, where he teaches people some key concepts in writing. We are using some of his essays in order to grow our knowledge graph. And so one of his essays here is called Bring a Unique Dessert. In this essay, he describes how bringing your unique ideas to your writing is going to be important for developing your own voice. So I have a note here that's called unique. And within that note, I have a block quote where we are quoting David's original essay. Now you could see the notation I use is a pound sign or a hashtag David Perel. Now this is going to be a way that I can tag this idea as David's as opposed to one of our original ideas. Now this is going to be important because these tags now are a system that allows us to add information to our note. But this is different than linking our note to another one. So what types of information are we going to then use as tags? Well, this is what I've recently figured out. We can use tags to represent person, places, or things. See, our knowledge graph is this growing body of ideas. And within these ideas, we want to sometimes add or attribute these ideas to different people, different places where we had the idea or where the idea came from, or different things. And things, of course, is going to be much more generic. But if we approach our tags with this concept, a tag is a person, a tag is a place, or a tag is a thing, we now are equipped to use tags in an intentional and meaningful way. See, I had a problem before of my tags were haphazard. They didn't have a consistent style. They didn't have a consistent system. And my tags ended up being sort of this unwieldy network and mess of ideas. So now what we can do is we can intentionally use tags as a person, as a place, or as a thing. And this now is going to be an obvious system for us to work within to develop our tags. I'm going to take a moment now to add some tags to my growing knowledge graph. I will try to add some persons, some places, or some things as representative examples of how we can use these tags within this system. I've already added David's essays numbers 11 through 15. I'm putting the links below so that if you want to see these essays, you can read them and add them to your growing knowledge graph. Let's take a look at some tags that I added and see how I used these. In the next essay here called You Already Have a Voice, David talks about how your voice is your personality coming through on the page. This is a consistent theme that he's discussed in previous essays where your unique voice is going to be something that you bring to your writing. Your unique voice is something that you already have and your unique voice is something that you develop through your new habit of writing. These interrelated ideas are how David brings together this concept of voice. I've added this in my linked note called voice here, where we have three of these key points. Now, I've also added a couple of tags. So in this case, I want to add that this essay is by David Perel. Down here, I also added an additional tag, which is to indicate that this is a quote by Tyler Cohen. 
David has quoted Tyler Cowen several times in his work lately, which makes me think that he's reading several of Tyler's works. In this case, I want to tag this note with Tyler Cowen, indicating that this is an idea, this is in fact a quote by Tyler. If I want to go and search later for every element of David's essays that include an idea by Tyler, then I can do this using the tag. This is how we do it in Obsidian. First, in Obsidian, we need to go to the settings. That's down here in the lower left-hand side. When we click on the settings, we can now go to the core plugins menu on the left. We can use tags out of the box in Obsidian, but one of the useful things is to be able to find all of our notes that contain a certain tag. So in our core plugins, we can scroll down and we can activate this tag pane. When we exit from here, we can then go ahead and um, come back to our essay. Our essay now has a couple of tags. And we can click on the upper right-hand side where we expand this menu. This first tab that we have open shows the backlinks that we have for Tyler. We can see that here's one backlink um, invoice, but what we wanna do is we wanna look for tags, not for backlinks. So if we click on tag, we can see now a list of all of the tags that I have in here. I have David Perel. These are 17 different tags for 17 different essays. The second is Tyler Cowan. It looks like he has three different tags. When I click on this tab, I can look over on the left-hand side over here and see that three different notes come up now that all have Tyler tagged in them. I can come down here, I can see Albert Einstein. This is another tag. And so I told you before, tags can be a person, a place, or a thing. This is how I like to think about tags. And now you can see I've heavily used person as an idea. Every time a person is mentioned, I then turn this into a tag so that if Tyler Cowan is mentioned again, or David Perel has another essay, I can very easily find all of the ideas. I also said we can use this as a place or a thing. So as one example of place, I have ancient Rome here. So ancient Rome is a place. If I knew there was some mention of ancient Rome and I wanted to then find that again, I can click on here and see, ah, this is describing the memory palace idea. A memory palace is a memorization technique that was used in ancient Rome. So in this way, I can quickly find, I knew there was something about ancient Rome and this is the way for me to find it. I said notes can be a person, a place, or a thing. So the last thing I want to show you is this idea of what a thing is. So here I have a note where a post-it note is my tag. So David describes his use of post-it notes as a physical structure and representation of an outline of an essay before he begins to write. I think that post-it notes might come up again as a tool for him to use. And so I wanted to then tag post-it note as a thing because maybe sometime later, I'm going to then think, oh, there was something about post-it notes. Where was the essay or where was the idea that David Perel talked about his post-it note method? So I can then, as because I know I have it as a tag, I can then come here and can say, oh, that's it. It turns out the tag is in this paragraph here of his essay, Create a Physical Structure. He organizes his long form essays with post-it notes. Now, he then in the very next sentence describes one idea for a post-it note, post-it note, post-it note, and so on. I don't need to tag every single instance of post-it note because remember what I want to do is I just want to create some sort of link between my brain and the place in this knowledge graph where post-it note exists. I don't need to highlight every single example within this note, just one, because then when I click on it in the future, it will come over here in the left-hand side. We have two additional types of structures that can help us organize our notes. The first is folders, and the second are tables of contents. Let's talk about folders for a moment. The power of network notes comes from a structure and organization that is not bound by a hierarchical folder file system. When we are talking about an idea, let's say we're talking about our voice. This is something that David Perel talks much about in his essays. If we have an idea about voice, does voice go into a folder about writing? Or does voice go into a folder that is about thinking? Or does voice go into a folder that is about speaking? In each of these three cases, having your unique voice is going to impose your view of the world on your thinking, your writing, your speaking. And so we might be then stuck with this organizational challenge about how to think about these notes. Again, you know this, which is why you are embracing this idea of knowledge graphs and building your own knowledge graph. 
So then what can we use folders for? Do folders have a place now in this knowledge graph space? I think they do. And I could see two places where this might be beneficial. The first is an answer to a question I received often, which is, should I have more than one vault for my notes? I think that the idea of building a knowledge graph to enhance connections across disparate ideas means that the most powerful knowledge graphs are going to be where different ideas from different domains can be connected. However, if you work in two dramatically different spaces, as you know, I'm a university professor and I run a basic science research lab. My research ideas might be completely separate from my ideas on productivity and thinking and creativity. And in that case, I might want to impose some folder organization for notes that are related to hardcore science compared to notes that are related to productivity, tools, thinking, and systems, and so on. In this case, I would encourage you to still keep all of your ideas in one vault, except that you might want to have a folder organization to keep these ideas separate. Let's see what that looks like here. If we come back to our essays here, we can see that all of these are in one folder. We could add a new folder, and let's say this new folder is going to contain a very discrete set of ideas, and let's say that I would call this science. And perhaps all of my notes about science are going to go into this directory or this folder, whereas everything else could be into another directory, another folder. But again, I'm really pushing myself and challenging myself to try to keep all of my ideas in a single vault, because you never know when an idea about hardcore science is going to be relevant for an idea about creativity. Another thing I like to do is I like to organize all of my attachments. In the last video, I showed you how you can make an attachment and add this directly to your note. If you look here over on the left-hand side, you can see I have two attachments. What I might do is make a new directory called attachment. And then what I can do is I can make this directory the default place for all of my attachments. This is how you go about doing that. In order to set a default location for your attachments, you come down to settings. Settings has an option on the left called files and links. From here, you can then set your attachment folder path. Place newly created attachment files, such as images created via drag and drop or audio recordings in this folder. So I'm going to do this, and you can see that I have my root directory. That's where all of my default ones are. This is the science directory I just made or my attachment directory that I also made. Now when I have new attachments, they'll automatically go into here. This is definitely a good use of our directory structure. It will keep this clean rather than having all of my different attachments interspersed between my notes. Now you might be asking, why are 1.png and 2b.jpg still here? The reason is because the file setting that we just changed is only going to apply to new attachments. So what we would need to do is drag and drop these into our attachment folder, just like this. Now we can go to the original note, which contained these attachments, and we can make sure that those links were updated. The original essay was called Diversify Your Vernacular, and this was an essay about word choice. And sure enough, Obsidian was smart enough to update our links so our images still appear. The second thing that we want to discuss is tables of contents. Now, there are a lot of opinions in the note-taking space about how and whether to use tables of contents. I strive for simplicity in my note-taking systems, and therefore, I'm going to use the idea of these tables of contents sparingly. In the case of David Perel's essays, we might want a master list of all of his essays. In this case, this could act like a table of contents for this project. What I can do then is I can make a new note and I can then call this master list of David's essays or something of the like, and I can list out a link to all of his essays. And this might be an easy and useful thing for me in the future in order to find specific essays. Let's make that now. Now, we have these essays, and they're now in a master list, but they're not linked to the essays within our knowledge graph. So let's take another moment and link them.
Another thing I might want to do is turn this into an ordered list so that I can refer quickly to which essay number corresponds to the essay. The last thing I did is I added a special notation. In preview mode, we previously had a link to a note of David's original essay, plus a long messy string of a URL that links to his original source on his website. What I wanted to do is clean this up a little bit, and so I can use a special notation where I add a link text that I want in brackets. And then after, in parentheses, with no space in between, I add the URL. This is what it looks like. I add our link in brackets. This is a single bracket as opposed to the double bracket. And then with a single parentheses, I add the link that I want to, and this is going to link out to David's website. If I click on the first link here, it's going to take me to David's essay that I have as a note within a my knowledge graph. If I click on this word link here in preview mode, this is going to link me now to David's website where he has the original essay. So you can see now this table of contents is going to be a useful growing list of links to these original essays. The thing I would caution you is some people have the tendency to overcomplicate their systems, to have tables of contents for major ideas and for this and that and so on, or to have all sorts of different structures for their tags. What I'm trying to encourage you to do is think of a simple system for your tags and to think of simple ways to use directories and tables of contents so that your system sticks, just like a post-it note. If you like this video, let me know or give a comment below. If you want to see more videos like this, go ahead and hit subscribe. We will be continuing our journey through this note-taking system in order to identify the best practices so that you can have your own knowledge graph system and come up with better ideas.